What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Atlanta Falcons free agency update show presented by Ticketmaster. I'm Scott Bear alongside Derek Rackley and Dave Archer, and we're here to break down all the moves Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith made since free agency opened on March 15th. And guys, they've been busy yeah. for sure. <laughs> Why? Because the Falcons have had tons of salary cap space, and in my opinion, they've used it really well, adding several talented players, re-signing more than a few of their own, and trading for another one. Elite safety JC Bate, Jesse Bates was a Cincinnati Bengal. Now he's a Falcon. Pro Bowl guard Chris Lindstrom signed a massive five-year extension. Tied in Johnu Smith came over in trade, in addition to several other big moves I haven't even mentioned yet. We're going to break them all down and examine areas where the Falcons got better and how free agency sets them up for the NFL draft. Plus, we're going to hear from Terry Fontenot in an exclusive interview with our Tori McElhaney. But before we do all that, let's see what some of these new Falcons can do. We're excited about the phase that we're in. It was a great opportunity for us to go win that division. We're excited. We, we've got the people to make it happen. It's our job to win our division. The scar is going to be the limit. John U. Smith. I'm going to bring all of them. Hey, look at John U. Smith. I'm going to bring these Look at him go. Goodness, He's a tight end. Amazing. Toughness, tenacity. I'm just going to make plays. That's a heck of a job. John U. Smith. Unbelievable catch by Smith. How does it feel to be a Falcon? This is the most exciting moment of my NFL career. For the Atlanta Falcons, they add a big piece as well. Look who jumped in front. This is Jesse Bates. Jesse Bates. Here's a pass. What a pick. Picked off by Jesse Bates. It's a interception touchdown for Jesse Bates. How about this one? David on your motto. Expect great things. Wings on every down. Brady will go down for the fourth time tonight. David on your motto. Brought down by on your motto. Under pressure. And Going down this time, it's David on Yamada. Down he goes. On Yamada was in there first. I'm so excited and ready to come and, and put on a show out here. Let's go. It's Caden Ellis. He can fly. Caden Ellis chases him down. Passionate. I'm just ready to go. Number 55. He just keeps coming. And Caden Ellis been all over the place. Feels great. It's kind of a dream come true. Taylor Heineke, big time game. Just see me kind of grit things out and, and try and find a way to win. Keeps the play alive. Yeah. First, the first down. Dives to the pro yes. Touchdown. Oh, what on me? He's got a big time arm. Here comes the big time arm. Look at him go. You know, I saw a great opportunity, um, you know, for me to come in and uh, feel like I can be a difference maker on this defense. We yeah, had the right pieces, obviously the trajectory is the right way. Uh, let's let's be a part of that. Let's try and help that ship move in the right direction. That's a heck of a John U. Smith. Now, how on earth can you not be fired up about these new <laughs> Falcons free agents after watching that video? Right? I'm, it's like goosebumps on the arms a little seriously, bit Seriously, like I'm ready to run through a brick wall, right? <laughs> uh, but before we get to all these new faces, let's talk about a very familiar one. Chris Lindstrom just signed a massive five-year extension. It was one of the first moves that the Falcons made right as free agency opened. How key was that, Arch, to bringing Chris Lindstrom back, and how important is it to maintain continuity on that offensive line? Arthur Smith keeps saying offensive line will be a part of our foundation moving forward. Well, when you talk talking about solidifying the big eaters up front, it's a big deal. Um, you're, you ran to the tune of about 155 yards a game last year. They're number three in the league, I think, running the football. Uh, continuity and doing what you need to do from a group standpoint uh, makes, a big, makes a big impression on being able to keep that going. This is one of the tightest groups on any football team is their offensive line. They go out and eat together. They spend time together even when they shouldn't be spending time together. It, that's, it's the tightest group, Rack will tell you, the tightest group on a team is the offensive line. And to keep one of the guys that's now burgeoning one of the leaders on that team, uh, when you start talking about what Chris Lindstrom has been able to do, I think he's garnered a lot of respect around the league. He's uh, fashioned himself into one of the best at the position. You look at the grades, if you trust all that kind of stuff, he grades out as one of the best players in the National Football League is his position. 
and you got to talk about defending your your quarterback whoever the quarterback is you got to be able to take care of the quarterback it starts with those guys up front and so Lindstrom being in there and being maybe kind of a pseudo leader we know Jake Matthews is still in there but being part of that leadership group that's in there big deal yeah anytime Arch you talk about coaches and how you're going to be successful in the game of football not just on the offensive line but in the game of football your lines of scrimmage have to be shored up and we've talked about this on the podcast over the last couple of years and to be quite frank the offensive line wasn't all that great right but they've changed some things around players have gotten better and a guy like Lindstrom has really upped his game and so now you think about what the Falcons want to do they want to run the football they want to be physical up front you don't have to worry about bringing somebody else in now that has to learn that language from that position you got a guy right here right inside your building that has proved his worth and that is ready to continue to produce for this organization so it was a great move by locking him up and I really like the fact that when you do well and you work hard and you fit into what the franchise culture is, they are going to pay you. I think this is another statement extension. I think that is an important part of this as well. But the offensive line was good last year. Arthur Smith said very plainly, they have to get more explosive within the passing game. So they bring in Mac Hollins. They bring in Johnu Smith. Are those the types of players that can help in that effort to get that downfield threat to make the passing game uh, better and more productive in 23. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about offense in the NFL, and yes, there's a couple of staples. It's offensive line, it's quarterback play, but outside of that, guys, it's weapons. You have to have weapons on the offensive side of the ball. Go to the most explosive offenses in the NFL, and you're going to find weapons or playmakers, right? Not necessarily guys that are all running 4-3, but guys that have proven to make plays. So you bring in a big body tight end like Johnny Smith. What do we know about Arthur Smith? He loves him some tight ends, okay? Not only does he love some tight ends, he loves athletic tight ends. You go back and look at some of the different areas, some of the different formations that they have put Jonu Smith in. They've turned around and handed him the ball out of the backfield. Pretty impressive for a guy that's about 250 pounds. Athletic, can catch the ball, creates mismatches, by the way, there's a guy named Kyle Pitts in this organization, so pretty good too. So now you've got two elite athletes at the tight end position. Maybe Kyle's going out for passes. Maybe John who's blocking. Maybe you flip-flop those two. So now you bring in options. So another guy like Mac Hollins, you bring in height, six foot four. Guy that was kind of a rotational player his first few years, had a breakout year and a contract year, and ended up catching like 44 passes this past year with the Raiders and kind of proved his worth. So he's coming in as another piece, another weapon for this offense to find ways to get the ball downfield. And I think that's what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith have done with these two playmakers. Yeah, I look at, I look at it from the other perspective. I, I'm the defense who's trying to prepare for the Falcons. And if I'm getting ready to go and I've got Drake Leonard and I've got Kyle Pitts, I can find a way to hem those guys in. But if, I got, if I've got an addition of three more players, throw in the, back, the, in the fact that CP and, and, and Tyler Algier can make plays in the backfield as well, out of the backfield, doing some things, catching the ball as well as running the ball. Now all of a sudden it's a tough deal. I'm preparing on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to get ready to play this Falcon team. I'm not just looking at two players now. Now all of a sudden they've got a, a myriad of players they can get the football to that are impactful, whether it's moving the chains, making explosive plays as you were referencing, and you're going to need to do that in the passing game if you want to evolve as an offense. But when I get in the red zone, when I put points on the board, now I've got guys, multiple dudes that have problems, that create problems from a catch radius standpoint to an athleticism standpoint. Mm -hmm. And who do I look at? Who do I defend? It creates major problems. And when you look at this offense as a whole, the Falcons also made no mistake about the fact they said, we're going to address the quarterback spot. Well, they had to because they have Desmond Ritter and they have Logan Woodside, and that's it. So they, But who were they going to add where? How much money were they going to spend? They ultimately bring in Taylor Heineke in free agency, lots of experience, a pretty good overall record, a gamer, right? What do you guys think of, about bringing in a guy of his experience level uh, in, like, into the fray here. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Scott, in the fact that he's played, yeah. okay? And so you're not bringing a guy in that hadn't played very much. This guy's played quite a bit. Plus, he's been through adversity, which I like. I like a quarterback that's had to deal with stuff. Played in Carolina, played in Washington, uh, has had to deal with some disappointments uh, because you're only better through some of the things that, go, that are hard that you have to go through. He's had to do that. He had to sit and watch. Next thing you know, he's starting. Next thing he's back on the bench. 
So this guy has the versatility to be able to adjust to all that type of stuff. I think that's a big deal. Plus, local kid. Went to Collins Hill High School, which is cool. It's going to mean more to him. And I, I'm not saying that his opportunities in Carolina and, and Washington didn't mean something. He's playing in front of his family every weekend now. He's, he gets a chance to be in front of his family. And then his ability from an experience standpoint to share what he knows in a quarterback room that's going to have some young guys in it, I think it's a big deal. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about the quarterback position because one of the, the mantras, if you will, of this organization has been toughness, right? You don't generally talk about a quarterback with toughness, mm -hmm. but that's probably one of the words that I would use with Taylor oh, Heineke. We're all pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we, <laughs> we, we, we... Oh, no, Dave's saying that quarterbacks Yeah, are, Dave's are saying quarterbacks yeah. Are But I would tough. say that Taylor Heineke, is a, yeah. he's a tough guy. I like, agree. he goes out there and he just competes, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't doesn't really care about what it looks like. He cares about getting the results, getting the job done. Do I have to throw the ball 19 times or do I have to ball, throw the ball 39 times? Do I need 149 yard passing or 349 yard passing? What do I have to do to help yeah. the team win? That's point. the type of player that I think they brought in. Well, and you're also, you, you don't have to go very far. Go back a couple years ago, he came in here with Washington and beat us by making those screwy plays, <laughs> running around, staying alive, being tough, and making a play. He beat Atlanta right here in our building. So there's a little bit of uh, past history with this guy. Yeah. You know that he, what he can do. I'm, I definitely think that it's pretty clear just from this conversation that the Falcons have gotten better on offense. Will they continue to add? Of course they will. But I think some of these early additions have been key. And we're going to – Dave Archer's gone into the film room. He studied <laughs> brand-new tight end Jonu Smith, and he's going to show you exactly what he can do and what he has done. It's going to be a fascinating segment using all the power of our brand-new Ticketmaster Studios. Let's take a deeper dive and a look into Johnu Smith, the six foot three, two hundred and forty eight pounder that Atlanta got in the trade with New England. Johnu lined up on the line of scrimmage here, conventional tight end position. Now it's a three count screen, so Johnu is going to help with the tackle just a little bit, and he's going to release in the flat. Perfect location, top of the numbers. That's where the quarterback, that's where I'm looking for him to be. Now, locate the blocking. Lineman out in front gets a good key block here. Now it's about John U. Smith and his ability from an athletic standpoint to step on the accelerator, stay right on the hip of the blocking, and then shove it in the end zone. It's what he did eight times in 2020 with Arthur Smith calling the plays. Look for him to be a big part of that. Very similar play that Tyler Algier scored on in week eight against the Carolina Panthers. Now let's look at some of the versatility for Johnny Smith. Short motion, now out wide, stack formation. Third and 14 now, so this is a play where you're going to get zone coverage. Chargers playing zone coverage. Johnny Smith is flare control, going to come underneath. He's essentially the check down on this play. Clearing coverage, gets the ball in the check down. Now, you'll got 10 yards to go. What can Johnny Smith to help me extend this drive? It was third and 14. I need him to go get a first down. Breaks two tackles, three tackles, First down, out near midfield, and all of a sudden we got something cooking when it talks about offense. His versatility, line up in a spot, run after the catch. You're getting all of this with John U. Smith. You want to find a position for this guy? Call him Weapon. Steps up in the pocket and hits Caden Ellis. This time it's shut down and it's Caden Ellis. Now, we've taken a deep dive into what the Falcons brought in on the offensive side of the ball, but they brought in a lot of deep, like defensive dudes who can <laughs> absolutely get after it, which I think was a real priority heading into this free agent period. And let's start with the pass rush. Again, if you talk about Falcons brass, Terry and Arthur have been very forthcoming about what they need. Pass rush was another one of those things that they made no uncertain terms. We have to add to that. They added to it with a couple of former Saints who Terry Fontenot and Ryan Nielsen know really well. David Onyemata and Caden Ellis, a linebacker who had seven sacks last year. 
when you look at those guys, how can they help improve this Falcons pass rush? Two obviously very, uh, very different players. Both guys can get after the quarterback. Yeah, what's kind of interesting here, Scott, is the need for pass rush help up front, but it doesn't come from a traditional defensive end pass rusher, right? The start of this free agency period came more in the middle of the defense and from the linebacker position, but you get familiarity and you get history. Two guys in Anyamata and Ellis that obviously Terry Fontenot and Ryan Nielsen know quite well from their days in New Orleans. So, okay, you, you, you put all this information together on the available free agents. Do they fit in what we're doing? But then do we happen to know a little bit more about these guys than maybe our competition does? And that's exactly what happened upstairs with these two guys that you bring in. You think about a guy like David Anyamata, 23 sacks over his last six seasons from that interior defensive tackle position. For Falcons fans, just as comparison, Grady Jarrett has had 28 and a half sacks over that same span, right? So he's been basically just as effective as what we feel like has been one of the better interior defensive tackles in Grady Jarrett. So I think that bodes well for the Falcons defense. Then you get a guy like Caden Ellis, who was really a special teams player his first few years in the league, but then because of opportunity, because of injury, he gets thrusted into the defense more. And what does he do? He just goes out and balls, has a great year in a contract year, shows his athleticism, shows his versatility, not only being able to play the run, but also rush the passer and get after it with sacks. So they bring in two guys that are still young, productive, and they know a lot about the internal makeup of each player. Yeah, Arch. I think it's really a big deal that the two guys have a feel for Ryan Nielsen as the defensive coordinator. I don't think there's a question about that. I think the part that I point to is how do we get the pass rush? Got to stop the run. Okay, you got to stop the run game. Atlanta, not very good against the run over the last several seasons. In fact, when you start looking at time of possession, Atlanta would swell up in the red zone. But from 20 to 20, teams are moving the ball, and all of a sudden it's third and three. It's third and two. How do you get there? Got to stop the run. David Onyemata, I love the pass rush, what he brings to the table. In addition, I'm looking to stop the run, guys. And you've got two guys here that want to hit people. Want, they want to shorten necks, okay? They want to come in there, <laughs> stuff the run game. And now all of a sudden it's third and nine. Now it's third and eight. It's third and ten. Now pass rush can get after you, but I can't really depend on a pass rush because if I'm sitting waiting his run coming, that's what happens on third and three, third and two. But if it's third and nine, third and ten because of how good you've done on first and second down, these two guys to me are going to make the biggest impact right away in the run game. And then the addition to that will be getting after the passer. Now Ellis can come from everywhere. He's a he's a he's a, a guy that's developing as an edge guy, but he's coming from the inside. Remember who he played with? Demario Davis, in my opinion, is one of the best linebackers in the National Football League. There's a guy that comes through the middle, makes plays. This guy's learned from one of the better players there. So all that factors in. But uh, I think these two guys are going to help in the front seven. First of all, stuff in the run game, and then we get the, the residual in the pass game. Yeah, Rack, I, I thought you brought up a really good point that when, when you're adding talent in the middle up front and you compared like what these guys have done and what Grady Jarrett has done, how often do we talk about Grady Jarrett makes others around him better? Well, can we flip that on its ear and say adding these types of players, building through the middle, can help Grady Jarrett be Absolutely. better? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you get a guy like Anyamata now, you can't necessarily just double team Grady Jarrett on, on those early down situations or on passing down situations because Anyamata has shown throughout his career that if you single block him, he can beat you, right? So then it, it becomes a decision on the offensive side. Who are we going to double? Are we going to double? Are we going to keep a running back in to chip these guys on the way out? Um, so there's a lot of options from a defensive side and how the offense attacks these pass rushers when you have two proven guys up front that can make a difference. Well, and, and think about it along these lines, too. If now, all of a sudden, you have another Grady Jarrett. Let's just say it that way. David Onyemata and Grady Jarrett are in the interior. We've been seeing Grady get doubled a number of times throughout his career. Now Onyemata's in there just as Rack talked about. Who are you going to double? You know, let's factor it out further. Now that Arnold Ebicady is coming off the edge, Lorenzo Carter is coming off the edge, now I've got to not only do I can I not use interior guys to fan out to take care of those guys because I've got a problem in the interior with two guys. Now I've got two guys coming off the edge that are working against tackles. 
I've got to keep a tight end and a back end to chip. I'm a quarterback. I don't want those guys back there with me. I want them out in the pattern. So if I've got a back and a tight end there having a chip release, yeah, now point. all of a sudden there's not enough people in the secondary to affect the back seven in pass prote- in, in the in the pass game. I want to manipulate those guys high, low, short, where I can throw the ball in holes. If I don't have enough people out, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. So that's where it kind of expands out. Weapons, we talked about offensively. These are weapons on defense that are going to help Ryan Nielsen do a lot of stuff. And as the Falcons have continued to build through the middle, which is exactly what they've done, then let's go from defensive line to linebacker to safety, which is really a big ticket item in Jesse Bates. I think he was the number four rated free agent in this class. He can do so much. Guys, what makes him so special? Why was he such a huge pickup? For this defense. Well, number one, he's cerebral. This is a guy that understands the game, meaning he, he can play in the back end and roam. He can come down in the box. I think the thing that sticks out for me when I put on the tape uh, of, of Jesse Bates is his ability to tackle. I think that's something that this team wanted to improve. You're going to get that with Cade Nellis, good tackler. Look, put him on tape. You don't see Anyamata miss much up front. He gets an opportunity, boom, he's got a guy on the ground. Bates is like that. He's a guy that comes down from the safety spot, whether it's coming down in that last line of defense or coming down to be a part of the run defense before the ball snap. Great tackler. Has the ability to also defend in pass game. Tight ends in the slot. Slot receivers. Has the ability to have 14 career interceptions. So the guy's a, little, a bit of a ball hawk. You add that to the fact that uh, you got Richie Grant who had a career year last year got what second on the team in tackles a year ago maybe Jalen Hawkins in there as well now all of a sudden you got three guys interchangeable you can go big nickel right you can yep. get three yeah. safeties on the field all three of those guys can cover but they all can, can they can all tackle in the run game Jesse Bates brings a, a degree of credibility in the back end if I'm a safety or if I'm a quarterback I know who Jesse Bates is yeah you might not have known some of these other guys. I know who that guy is. <laughs> I'm not going to throw it in that guy's direction, or at least I'm going to be very careful to make sure that I find him before I let the ball go. So Bates brings that credibility. He also brings some high-level play. Guy's an excellent athlete. Take the ball to put it in the end zone. He can take the ball away. You, you know, you talked about the other two safeties currently on the roster in addition to Bates. When I was thinking about this, I'm thinking they have youth but yet experience at the same time, right? The two safeties you just mentioned, they've been here for a little while. They've played football, so it's not like it's their rookie year. But then you bring in a guy like Bates who is now you know, going into his sixth season. He has been around. He's a guy that you talk about his first few years in the league with the Bengals was not so great. He even talked about it in his press conference, right? But then his last two years, a couple of free agent additions, a draft pick, and all of a sudden the Bengals are a really good football team. What happens? They go deep into the postseason. So now you get a guy that's coming into the secondary, that's played deep into the postseason, played in a Super Bowl. So now you've got the experience on the back end, right? But you talked about versatility, playing the run and playing the pass. When I watched some tape, I saw instincts with Jesse Bates. Knows exactly where he needs to be. You can tell that he studies tape, Scott, and he's where he needs to be to knock footballs away, which he's done throughout the course of his career. A key point Rack just brought up there, and I think it may have flown over people's heads. Everybody you're bringing in has played in the postseason. You're going to have a tough time finding a lot of guys on this roster prior that have played a lot of postseason. Grady Jarrett, certainly uh, you know, some of the older guys. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about young players. Bates just played. He went to a Super Bowl. Okay, These are guys, John U. Smith's been in the playoffs. I mean, these are guys, David Onyemata, playoffs. Okay, That's, a, that's something that's in, that kind of permeates the rest of the locker room. We need to be in the playoffs. You need to be in the postseason. These guys have had that and they got the experience. Yeah, and being comfortable in yeah, that moment. They've absolutely. proven what they can do in the postseason. Yeah, and b- because there are so many younger guys, we, we, we saw in close games in 2022 that, that they're gaining that experience to have leadership in those areas can be huge. Uh, one last question on the defensive side here. You had Jesse Bates. You still have A.J. Casey Hayward's been around the block a couple times. Richie Grant is an ascending player. Is the secondary sneakily, quietly turning into a team strength? Do you think it's it's heading in that direction that maybe this secondary can oh, to I, be really good? I definitely think it's heading in that direction. Yeah, I think not only have you added some experienced players, you've added competition, yeah. which is exactly what they want in the NFL. You don't necessarily have a guy that's looking over his shoulder saying, well, I know this guy's not better than me, so I'm going to play, right? And what happens is you get a little bit complacent in that situation. But instead, when you look over your shoulder and say, this dude's pretty good. Like, they brought him in. They paid him some money. Mm-hmm. He's produced before. This guy has to play better. 
right? This guy has to produce. This guy has to go out and practice harder. Once you bring competition into the fold, you truly get the best of each individual. Well, and I think the competition makes it happen, potentially what you're talking about, because right now it's on paper, right? Yeah, right. It's, it hasn't been proven out. Now, Bates has proven what he is, and Casey Hayward's had some moments when he proved he is, and, and so different guys have had little pieces. A.J. Terrell regarded as one of the better corners. Now if you can group all that together and make it happen on the field, yeah, now you can say it's one of the strengths. But on paper, it looks like it's kind of migrating that way. Doesn't <laughs> yeah, but, but, but as you pointed out, now they have to go out and yeah. then prove it. And Jesse Bates is going to be key to the entire defensive effort. And now it's Rack's turn to head over to the Telestrator and explain exactly what makes Jesse Bates so good. All right, let's dive into the X's and O's here. One of my favorite, favorite parts here. Jesse Bates, the new free agent acquisition coming from the Bengals. Let's look at some of the, his performance on the field. Now, this play in specific is going to be an all-out blitz by the Bengals. You see everybody's up at the line of scrimmage here. And on the back end, they're going to be playing man coverage. You see these guys are lined up across from the receivers. But then Jesse Bates lined up way back here, 15 yards away from the line of scrimmage knows that he's got number three in man coverage. Now, at the snap, you're going to see him come flying up, get his coverage responsibility. Not only does he deflect this football away from being completed, it ends up getting intercepted. So they steal a possession away from the Jaguars because of his recognition, his instincts getting up to make that play. Now let's look at him in run support because he's a willing tackler as well. A little bit closer to the line of scrimmage this time. They're going to run a little speed sweep coming across the formation. You'll see initially blocked up pretty well. Three black jerseys covering up three white jerseys. Now, there is a linebacker that you see is free, but I don't know if he's got the right angle to make this tackle. But Bates sees it, he knifes in there, and he's able to make this tackle. And look, see where the first down marker is? Short of the first down marker, it's third down. You know what happens after that. Punt team comes out on the field. Cincinnati gets the ball back. So that's just two plays to show you the difference maker that Atlanta gets. One in pass coverage, one in run support. So you're getting a willing and able defender all over the field. So kind of seems natural as to why a guy like Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith would bring in such an impactful player. Let's listen to the general manager and his thoughts on Jesse Bates and some of the other acquisitions. When you look at the work that's been put in over the course of two years, how gratifying is it now to you go into this free agency period with the second most cap space in the league? I would say a lot of patience from really everyone, uh, starting with the head coach, Arthur Smith. He, he has to look at it like, okay, we have to go out and find good, tough, competitive football players, and we have to do it on a budget, and, and that's not always easy. We're proud of the players that we're able to bring in. Uh, two years ago and a year ago, and, and it, was, it was a tight budget, but we still brought in some good football players. You want to build a championship roster, not just for one year, but for several years. And so you have to stay, have some balance, have some discipline, and make sure you're getting players at the right value because you're putting together a puzzle. One of the first things you guys do is extend Chris Lindstrom. How important was that contract for where you guys are, but also in kind of rewarding your own? Yeah, very important and he embodies all the characteristics and traits of the program that we want to be. And he's the type of guy that we want to build around. And we do want to prioritize two things. We want to prioritize our players and prioritize the front. Why was Jesse Bates someone you guys wanted to target? There's a certain profile of players we want to bring in. Smart, tough, highly competitive. They need to have a certain skill set and be really good at playing football. And yet the makeup is very important and, and he has all the characteristics that we look for and we obviously have a, a coach here in the secondary that overlapped with him and so we know him really well and we want players that are not only going to be good at their position but they're going to make people around them better and he's done that through his career. Now to talk about some guys who you actually have a, a nice little history with, Caden Ellis and David Onyemata. Yeah. 
just the way they play football. We talk about versatility, we talk about toughness, and we talk about violence and competitiveness. They really fit those characteristics. So we knew we wanted to add those players to the front seven. When Ryan came in, it just confirmed it. When it comes to kind of next steps in, in free agency, what, it, what do next steps look like? I know we're sitting here right now talking, but there's a bunch of stuff happening upstairs. Yep. Sometimes in that first wave of free agency, it's the big ticket guys, but constantly, whether we're talking about leading up to the draft, after the draft, once the season starts, we're gonna keep digging and we're gonna keep turning over every song and finding every player. So this is where the scouts and um, really earn their money with guys like that. And at the end of the day, that's what's most important. So guys, Terry Fontenot just talked about what comes next. So let's dive deeper into that aspect of it. We've seen the first wave of free agency go. They've added a lot of good players. The work is not done, right? So when you look at this roster and this depth chart, is there a, is there a particular position group where you think they need to add more guys here? Like which one comes to mind? Well, I think Terry Fontenot talked a couple of months ago about saying that we're going to upgrade at every position. Exactly. And we started to see that a little bit through free agency. But if I'm going to pick out one position group where they could use another talented athlete, I would probably go wide receiver, Arch. I mean, think okay. about what we've done in the passing game. Okay, obviously, Mac Hollins was brought in this year. Drafted Drake London a year ago. Kyle Pitts a couple of years ago. You've got options there. We talked about Cordell Patterson, what he can do in the run game and the pass game. But if they can find another guy that's got some ability to take the top off a of defense, somebody that can run past the secondary, somebody that the defense feels like if they make a mistake in coverage, this guy's going to be wide open down the field. I feel like that true explosive threat downfield is somebody else that you could add into the mix. Not to say that Drake London can do it, can't do it, but he is a mix between speed and physicality. Mm -hmm. He's going to use his body frame to kind of post up defenders, kind of like a basketball player will. But if they can add another piece to that wide receiver group, I think, again, talked about it earlier in the show, weapons, more weapons on the offense. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Rack. You start talking about stretching the defense horizontally down the field like this. you got to be able to stretch them vertically down the field. So horizontal, vertical. We've got a lot of horizontal guys. That vertical threat would be a big deal. I don't think there's any question about that. I'll probably go to the other side then. I'm going to look at the corner spot. I think that when you begin to look at the corner, we talked about Casey Hayward, talked about A.J. Terrell. Mike Hughes comes in as a guy that's going to be an addition. Cornell Armstrong has been re-signed. You've got some guys back in there, but if you've got one of these top flight corners sitting there, uh, potentially that could be a guy that you go with early on. Also, defensive tackle. I don't think you quit on the defensive tackle position. There's some guys, maybe not necessarily in the higher part of the draft, maybe in two or three, second or third round, that are guys that could did really affect this team and help from a depth standpoint. I just look at that edge rusher class, and I think you can't have enough of those dudes, right? Like, why not go out and get one more? But as we kind of move through the later stages of free agency, we're going to see kind of more depth pieces come in. But the NFL draft is still out there. Yep. And the Falcons have the number eight overall pick. And look, I'm not going to hold you guys to this. It's a little <laughs> early for that. But what are your early thoughts about how they could use that number eight overall pick to bring in one of those uh, top flight instant impact guys? Yeah, well, I talked about wide receiver, but Arch was talking about corner. Yeah. And I just can't get past a guy out of Oregon that looks like he's going to be available, right? So th there's probably going to be four quarterbacks that are going to be gone early on. Will Anderson's going to be gone early on. So then you get to a guy like Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon, and I feel like he is the piece that could potentially fit opposite A.J. Terrell, right? 6'1", he's got length, ran a 4'3'8 at the combine, so he's got that true speed. He's basically a three-year player, started his career at Colorado, transferred, didn't like the coaching changes, goes over to Oregon to play with Dan Lanning. What do we know about Dan Lanning? Really good defensive coach from his days at the University of Georgia. He basically just takes off, proves his worth, shows his ability to intercept passes. Again, I talked about the length. I don't know if he's going to be available, but if he is available, I think he's a guy that could be penciled in as a day one starter. Arch. I love the guy. I think he's an. Outside, I think he's the best corner in in the group, and I think there's like, there's probably four guys that are pretty pretty good players. Um, wow, you start trying to nail down what you'd like. I, I, I'm going to. I'll be honest with you guys, it'd be very difficult for me to pass Jalen Carter up if he's sitting there at eight. I know there's some things going on with him, and, and uh, hopefully those things get worked out. Uh, it's hard for me to even look past the Georgia players, whether it's Nolan Smith who blew up the combine, a guy that's a, a tremendous locker room guy. Yeah. Uh, those guys are winning for a reason. That's why, that's why they've won back-to-back -back national champions, championships. 
it's hard to kind of pass those kind of guys up. But uh, I would probably look, uh, you, Scott, you mentioned Edge. Uh, I've got a guy at Iowa State to keep an eye on, okay? Will, Will McDonald. Will McDonald, yeah. Will McDonald out of Iowa State now, all-time leading sacker in Iowa State history. And you're saying, wow, well, Iowa State, he's a homer. Yeah, <laughs> this, this guy can come off the edge. He was impressive at the Senior Bowl. Uh, he's a guy that continues to climb the charts. I think he's even mocked a couple times for Atlanta at eight. He's a guy that I would potentially look at as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tyree Wilson out of Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. If you trade back, maybe Iowa's Lucas Van Ness fits in there. They, ha they have a, a lot of interesting options. Oh, yeah. And I think they've added a lot of interesting players to this team so far. And we've gone over all of them. But please stay tuned to our YouTube channel at Atlanta Falcons, atlantafalcons.com. Terry and Arthur have more moves to make, guaranteed. But I'm Scott Bear. That's Derek Rackley. Dave Archer, thank you so much for joining us on the Falcons Free Agency Update Show presented by Ticketmaster.